Ah, nice and cool. A good refreshing drink of water. I'm sure I'm not the only one who could use one right now, but ah, how refreshing is water on a nice hot day? I'm sure you can think of it right now. We have plenty of them throughout the year in this valley. Cool drink of water. And we need it, don't we? We need water to survive. In fact, as I'm sure I don't need to tell you, most of our bodies are made up of water. Over 60% of our bodies are made up of water. And in our blood, 83% of our blood is made up of water. We need water. A doctor at one time told me that on a daily basis, if I were just to go about my day-to-day duties, that I would need eight eight eight-ounce glasses of water. If you exercise, you need even more. Now, that being said, I'm sure that there's some disagreement, but there's no disagreement that you need water. In fact, studies have shown that if you go more than three days without water, you die. We like water that we can control. Water that's in a bottle. Water that's in a spigot in our house. We like water that we can tame, that we can put into place. But we don't like water so much when it's in the form of a wave that crashes over and destroys homes and families, do we? We don't like showers of rains that flood the land, taking away things that are of value to us. We like water in a bottle, but waves scare us. We like water in a shower, but the endless showers of a flood can be overwhelming. We like water that's tame, but not when it comes to our baptism, do we? We don't like, we don't want water that's tame or in our control when it comes to our baptism. We don't want water that can be held into our hands. We need water that can drown us, that can completely destroy the sin that is alive in each one of us. All of us know with full assurance that we have an old Adam or an old Eve living in us. We know that we are sinful people and that we are in need of being drowned to experience life. Paul makes this very clear in Romans chapter 6 when he says, don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. We had to die so that we could live. It's kind of backwards for us though, isn't it? It's kind of hard for us to understand that because when we think of water, when we think of that overwhelming surge that sucks our energy and our breath, it scares us. And right, we should be scared of baptism because it is powerful. It does have the capability to conquer sin, to conquer death, but not in itself. But water and the Word combined together has the power to defeat death. When we think of drowning, we think of that loss of air. We think of that loss of life, that that fighting, that struggle, and that's exactly what our old self does. Our old self struggles and it fights. It kicks and it thrashes. But it needs to be held under until that last bubble, that last gurgle comes. When we think about that, when we think about that completeness, that finality of death, we don't often think about that in baptism because we do, we we oftentimes will have a baptism at the beginning of a person's life, don't we? We don't have a baptism at the end of someone's life, but right at at the start. And so it's awful awkward to think about death and life. But we know that it is necessary, don't we? For not only is it we who need baptism, this new life, but it is all of creation. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And when we think about our baptism, we realize that we are all corrupted by sin. We are corrupted by that original sin before we could remember. In fact, we know that original sin entered us At the time, the sperm and the egg came together. At the time, before we could even see, before our parents knew we existed, at that point, original sin had already corrupted us. We are not just sinful people. We are sinners. It is a description of who we are, who we have become, what sin has made us. And we know that it goes downhill from our birth, doesn't it? Because we continue to sin. We can't even go even a minute without sin. And so each day, we again return to those waters of holy baptism. And we see the forgiveness that comes, the power, the drowning of the old self and the life-giving spirit that comes through Christ. But this brings up a difficult question. 
When we think of baptism, we think of the need that we have as sinners. So why do we celebrate Christ's baptism? Wait a second here. When we look at it, don't we say that Christ is the sinless Son of God? When we look at Christ, we see the one God made flesh. When we look at the baptism, we see baptism that is to provide forgiveness of what? Of sins, correct? And so when we look at forgiveness of sins, we look at, at in baptism and we look at Christ, we see a bit of a paradox, don't we? Why would Christ, the sinless Son of God, need to be baptized? Did the apostles make a mistake? Did we maybe mistranslate something somewhere along the way? Because it seems, it seems like this could be a difficult one to answer, couldn't it? When we think about our necessity of baptism, it's hard to think of how Christ could be sinless and still be baptized. Shouldn't he have been fine without baptism? Well, let's look at the first question there. Maybe it's a problem of the, the way the apostles recorded it. Maybe we have an issue here of, of just not completely be keeping track of the text. And so we look at and we look at Mark, and we see how the baptism is recorded. We see all the good news. We see the Spirit rising like a dove. We hear the voice of God. And we hear the same thing in Matthew and Luke. And the problem is, though, we hear the same thing in John, where oftentimes John is not in line necessarily with the other apostles. Here we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all giving us the same accounting. Then John gave this testimony. John the Baptist, by the way. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him, except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. No, in fact, we actually have further affirmation from John in this. We don't have any difference in the stories other than minor details between Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. We have a very continuous accounting of what happened. And if that's not enough, Isaiah foretold this in Isaiah chapter 40. You know, we're all familiar with that text where that uh, John the Baptist will come preparing the way for the Lord, making straight paths. Right after that, we have the promise that he will be glorified in the flesh before us promise that Christ will be baptized. So it's not a problem of a confused apostle here. Maybe it's an issue of translation. Perhaps it's a misunderstanding that we have reading from the English when we, should, when we need to go back to the Greek. Maybe we don't completely understand that word repentance or that word forgiveness. Because we have. John came baptizing in the desert region preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That word repentance that he uses, though, is the word metanoeo. And I've used this one before because this is the word that is almost always used in the New Testament to describe repentance. Whenever Jesus talks about our necessity of repentance, that word metanoeo is used. It literally means a changing of heart and mind. Not just a changing of mind, not just I'll go back and come back later, but a changing of heart and mind. That metanoeo is the word that we think of Every time of repentance, a sinner needs to turn back from sin. Now, the second word in that word, for forgiveness, it's not as common as the, as the word we usually use for forgiveness. But this word, ephesus, that we have here, it means, it means release from bondage. It means remission. It means deliverance. And it even means liberty. Liberty seems to be only our only outlier there. But don't we at times, many times, in both the Old and the New Testament, describe our struggle with sin as a bondage to sin? A struggle against the power that, the, that Satan has. And so again, that word forgiveness, that, that release from bondage, it seems to be right in line with everything. And so it seems so far we're struggling with this paradox still. The sinless Son of God needing to be baptized. Well, there has been an answer in the past to this. There's been an answer that more than a few people have gone with. But hopefully you'll see right away that this answer is no better than the first two. There are those who said Christ was not sinless. 
There are those who said that he was not sinless until he was baptized. That it was not until he experienced those waters of holy baptism. I hope a few of you are wrestling with this right now. Hopefully a few of you are hearing this and saying, now wait a second here. Because if you're not, if you're not, if you don't know Christ to be the sinless Son of God, we have a, huge, a bigger problem. Because if Christ is not the sinless Son of God, He could not be the atonement for our sin on the cross. If Christ is not the sinless Son of God, He cannot be the one who takes away the sins of the whole world. He cannot be the new Adam who replaces the old Adam that was corrupted. I know it's implausible, isn't it, to think that He could be sinless. But is it any more implausible than being born of a virgin? The God, Almighty God, taking on human flesh. Is it any more implausible than simple water and the Word bringing forgiveness? No, isn't that what faith is? Faith is those implausible things of Scripture. Faith is those implausible things that even though we don't understand how, that just two weeks ago we celebrated Christ entering the world, conceived conceived of by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, that it was God taking on human flesh, that it was God who went to the cross for our sins, that it is truly powerful, the gift of baptism. And so we're left with that paradox still, aren't we? Because these answers, they're, they're empty. And so why? Why did Christ need to be baptized? Well, it's the same that's true for many things in Scripture. Christ was baptized not because He needed it, but because we needed it. Christ was baptized not because He needed it, but because we needed it. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. Christ was baptized. He went to those waters of the Jordan, not because He needed forgiveness of sin, but because of our great need, because of our necessity to be forgiven of our sinfulness. Christ went to those waters of baptism first and foremost to show us the way, to show us the plan that God had for each of our lives. It is no accident that at the beginning of a service, that at the beginning of, our life, of the life of a child, that we baptize them. It is no accident that we bring them to those waters so early. And it is because of their necessity, to be need, their need for forgiveness. It is because of that original sin that infects each of us. And so Christ set the example for us by going to the waters of baptism Himself, by entering into the waters, and despite the protests of the Baptists, saying, let it be so now. But even then, we see something else that came. In the baptism, it was not Christ alone, was it? There are those who are in the habit of baptizing in the name of Jesus only. But it was not as though Christ was alone. It is not as though He said to, to the Baptist, baptize in my name. He said, as He went to those waters, let it be so now. And so the Father said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And so the Spirit rose up glorifying Him. And so even still we say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Following that first example. But not only is it an example for us, <clears throat> it is also, it was a preparation for Christ. He was baptized, not because He needed strengthening of His faith, but because of the strengthening of faith we need. The strengthening of faith we need each and every day. Christ was about to go and face his great adversary, Satan. Satan was ready and waiting. And I know, like I said, Mark is compressed. It's short. And so we have in two verses the whole temptation of Christ. But we know right here, this emphasis on the baptism was a preparation of time to get him re ready to face the tempter. To get him ready to face the one who would try to destroy God's plan. So in the same way, as Christ, as He prepared that water, as He prepared for that temptation, we are prepared for the temptations that life will come. But not with the weakness of simple water, but with the power of the Holy Spirit. The power the Spirit has to destroy sin and death. 
And finally, and most important for us, as Christ entered those waters of holy baptism, He entered them to make those waters holy for each one of us. Did you not hear in the words of the flood prayer, the words of our, of our prayers on a regular basis, that power that comes in the baptism, it is not simple water because although water can clean skin, although it can clean our cars and our houses, it cannot clean the soul. But it is that cleansing of water and the Spirit that brings cleansing to our souls. That is exactly what Mark, was when he recorded John's words, was saying, I baptize you with water but He will baptize you with His Holy Spirit. He was not referring to a separate baptism that's to come later. He wasn't referring to a baptism of the Spirit by anointing with fire. He was talking about the baptism that comes now for each one of us by water and the Spirit. By water and the presence of God. Because at each baptism, the, just as they were present then, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is present at each of our baptisms. He is present with us each and every day because it was not only a simple promise that He would only be here for this one moment in our life, but He is with us each and every day of our life. He is with us each and every day because on a regular basis, we need to destroy that old Adam or old Eve that lives in us. On a regular basis, we need to drown again that sinfulness that has so easily takes control of us. On a regular basis, we need to again come and be immersed in the love of our Savior. And that baptism, that baptism of Christ, while it is a paradox to us, we see how much we needed it. We see how much it was necessary for our redemption, for our life. And that baptism was that preparation for us as the children of God to live as His children. And as His children then, how do we live? As baptized sons and daughters of the King, how do you live? How is your life? I know for me, I need to constantly go back to those waters of baptism. I need to constantly go back and hear that message of forgiveness that came 28 years ago in my life. I need to constantly go back and hear again that promise of salvation. And I know that for each of us that there are times in our lives where we get far and we, and we get away from the church. There are times in each of our lives where we forget that baptismal promise. But our Lord, He never forgets us. He never forgets that at our baptism, He put His name on our heart. Because in that time, He made us His both now and for all eternity. Amen. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Holy Lord and Almighty Father, You have sanctified our baptism and You have made it holy. You have washed us and You have cleansed us and You have made us cleaner than snow. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to wash and cleanse us each day so that we would go forth as your children, as living examples of your love. Lord, we pray that you would constantly look after us, that even as we go down those paths of sinfulness in our lives, that even as we go after those temptations in our heart, that we would turn to you, the one who was like us in every way, but would, would not give over to sin. Lord, we pray that each and every day, we would know with full assurance the hope, the hope that comes being immersed in Your love, that we would know that one day we will celebrate with You in Your holy presence. And so it is in Your Son, in Your, in your Spirit, and in Your name we pray, O Father. Amen.